pray with me the prayer of the day for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Jonah, chapter 3, verse 10, through chapter 4, verse 11. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat down under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? He said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and perished in a day. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. I will exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to your greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will speak of your glorious splendor, of your majesty, and all of your marvelous works. They shall tell of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will recount your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. 
For them this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Jesus the very thought of thee With sweetness fills my breast But sweet afar thy face to see And in thy presence rest no voice can sing, no heart can frame, nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name. O Savior of mankind, O Jesus, our only joy be Thou, as Thou our price wilt be, Jesus, be Thou our glory. It is my honor to read for you the gospel, which is from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again around noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last work only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you hang around with your grandchildren very long, you're going to hear this phrase. That's not fair. He got a bigger piece of cake than I did. That's not fair. He has his toys and he's playing with my toys. That's not fair. Well, how come he gets to go to bed later than I do? That's not fair. Children are very concerned about issues of justice. They want things to be fair. Not necessarily for everybody else, but, you know, fair for them. 
And adults should be looking at justice issues as well, at what is liberty and justice for all. But adults really aren't that much better than children. They're just a little slicker at how they go about things. They are concerned about justice for me. In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus talks about this issue of justice. And he tells a parable that we're all familiar with. It's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And it goes like this. There was a vineyard owner who went down to the marketplace to hire day laborers. And he got some real early in the morning, and then he got some mid-morning, mid-afternoon. And at the end of the day, he went and hired even a few more with only one hour left to work in the day. And at the end of the day, he told the foreman, now give everybody, no matter how long they worked, give them one denarius, which was the standard wage for a day's labor at that time. And he said, and line them up with those who came the latest and pay them off first to those who came the earliest. And so he did. He paid them each one denarius, no matter how long they worked. And at the end of this, those who had worked the full, it was usually a 10-hour day, who had worked the full day said, well, that's not fair. He gave them the same as, as he gave us, and we bore the heat of the day and all of that work, and, and, and we should have got more. And then the vineyard owner said, didn't you get the agreed-upon wage? I haven't Done, what's your gripe? I haven't done you any harm. If I chose to be more generous to these others, isn't that kind of my business? So he was saying to them that justice is important and Jesus loved justice, just like all the Old Testament prophets loved justice. But it's important to go beyond justice into love and grace and mercy. Justice means I get what I deserve. Grace means I get what I don't deserve for good. I get more than I deserve. Justice is something that we're very concerned about right now in our country. And mostly it's about racial justice or rather racial injustice. And that people are saying, you know, we want to be treated just like everybody else. Black lives matter. We should have the same care from the police and from the government and from everybody else that everybody has. And I know some people get kind of tired of that, but here's the deal. When you are an oppressed group or a group that has been shamed in some way, there's going to be backlash because people do want justice and they seek that out. This has happened throughout our country with other ethnic or racial groups as well. There was, back in the late 1800s, you could see signs all over businesses that said N-I-N-A, no Irish need apply. The Chinese workers on the Transcontinental Railroad wanted equal pay and better working conditions. The Native Americans, they thought that the land was theirs, but then they found out after they signed treaties that that didn't make any difference, and they were swindled out of it. And when they protested that they wanted justice, well, then they were slaughtered wholesale, and that was the end of that. And so now they're trying to get justice by taking the white man's money through reservation casinos. But anyway, all of these groups wanted justice. Besides ethnic and racial groups, we have other groups like women's, women's the women's movement, National Organization of Women. Women wanted the same pay for doing the same work that men were doing. They wanted job opportunities to work in fields that only men had. When my mother was young, there were only about three different professions that were open to women. To be a nurse, which she was, to be a teacher, which she also was, to be a secretary. That was about it. They wanted to be able to be physicians and attorneys and bulldozer dozer drivers and electricians and CEOs of companies and anything else. My mother was the first woman that they ever allowed in nurses training who was married. You couldn't even be a married woman and be a nurses training. People don't remember that. And she was the first woman that was married and had children, kind of a pioneer, a groundbreaker uh, in that sense. And so women wanted those kind of, they, they felt they deserved e equality as well. And now we have uh, another group of people, and it's, it's not gender, but it is sexuality. 
So people of the LBGT community who have a different kind of sexuality or sexual orientation, they want to be treated as humans and individuals as well. They don't want to be mocked and beaten and murdered just because they are of a different sexuality. So all of these things deal with justice, and it's very important. The prophets over and over again talked about justice, treating people fairly, treating them well. The poor, the widow, the orphan, taking care of those who are disadvantaged. Uh, the prophet Hosea said, And what is it that the Lord your God requires of you? But to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. Jesus was very concerned about justice. However, he went beyond justice and talked about grace and mercy and love. And that's important in our personal relationships. Justice is one thing, but if you try to just deal with that in your personal relationships, it's not going to work very well because justice carries a kind of scorekeeping with it. Well, you know, if I'm a married guy and I'm doing more things than my wife is, well, then, you know, she kind of owes me. And, I, you know, that's not fair. Or if your coworkers don't seem like they're doing as much as you are, or if your friends aren't, aren't giving out the same friendship that you do. That kind of scorekeeping will destroy relationships. And so we need to be looking at mercy and love and grace rather than doing that. Those are the things that make a difference. Take our relationship with the Lord God. What if the Lord decided that he was going to give us what we deserve? Oh, oh goody, goody. The wages of sin is death. We don't, we don't want what we deserve. We want what Jesus deserved, and we want what he gives us, which is more than that, grace and mercy and love. So the, um, the workers in the vineyard is a story that shows us that, you know, none of us really bring anything to the table except our sinfulness. We may think that we're the workers who started early in the morning and worked all day, and, and therefore we're righteous and we deserve, but that's not the case. All of us, really, are Johnny-come-latelys to the kingdom of God. We don't deserve anything. But thank God that the Lord God doesn't stop there, that he gives us not what we deserve, but he gives us what we need. And then he asks us to emulate that and do the same thing. Don't just give people what they deserve. Give people what they need, love and grace and mercy. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. i yeah.